They say your first prize is six hours of studio time uh, with Marley Mall. At that time, the idea of making rap or music a career wasn't a thing. Where did the strength come from to fight this and go, yo, I'm not gonna let you be. Be who you are. Stop trying to stop trying to rap and be something, to rap about stuff that you don't know nothing about. I feel good, <laughs> I feel good. Did you feel like you were doing something that you didn't necessarily want to do? And I was like, oh, they kept my part. Oh, shoot. Wow. Okay. That's dope. The first place that it will be seen in its full production will be in London. So I need you to start spreading the word. That is dumbing down our creativity. It's dumbing down our ability to think for ourselves. And, and that's a little scary. Welcome back to the 521 Docu Chats. Today, I'm gonna to be talking with someone who is on my personal list of MCs that inspired me, and I'm sure many others. His intro into the world of releasing records was one of those beautiful accidents, which then led to 35 years of releasing music and still continues to this day. Before we begin though, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell to receive the notifications, like, share, and get involved in the comment section below. And now, Someone who I, in my humble opinion, consider to be the most consistent MC to ever have graced the microphone and the stage, the absolute legend and always forward thinker that is Master Ace. Yes, bro. How you doing? What's going on, man? Long time no see. Yeah, tell me about it, man. It's like, you know, I've been I've been in the sidelines, kind of watching little bits and pieces, and every time I hear you got something coming out, it's always exciting to see what you're on next. Cause, like I said, forward thinker. And that's something that you've always been. Still trying to prove myself. Oh, bro, I don't think you need to do that. But you know what? Actually, on the subject of that, there's something that I personally need to get off my chest with regards somebody like yourself. There are many okay. MCs that have got their flowers over the years. And I hear a lot of names mentioned that I have ultimate respect for because I learned from them and all that kind of stuff. But everyone knows Everyone who was there back in the days knows Master Ace, but the wider spectrum of people that don't really know about hip hop in the same way, don't know about Master Ace. And you're one guy that I feel really needs to be up there because everything about you is positive. Everything about you is refreshing. You know what I'm saying? You've always been inspirational, not just to me, but to many other MCs. You know, how, how do you feel about that? I appreciate you saying that. Um, I've just, I've kind of reached a point um, in my career where I can't worry about that stuff. Like I got to leave that up to, to the fans, to the tastemakers, to the DJs, you know, you, I leave it up to them to decide, you know, where my place is, what level of flowers, what, a, what, a, how big the bouquet is supposed to be. Like, I don't worry about that. I just really try to keep creating, keep coming up with, uh, either music or projects that I think are going to be inspire people that are going to be entertaining um and so yeah i i don't get bogged down in it. there's a, a lot some of my peers they get bogged down and getting the feeling that they didn't get the credit they deserve and they really spin their wheels trying to convince the world that they should be spoken about more but i don't feel like that's my job great answer because um i think a lot of people when they do that they kind of get lost in a certain equation and i'm guilty of that as well but i'm retired so i'm not trying to pursue that career but i still feel like <laughs> there are certain people that you know, just basically, there should be more flowers. And like, when you mentioned the word bouquet, you know, your bouquet should be massive because you're up there with the greats and always have been. I learned a lot from guys like you and in particular you. And at the time there was your chill Rob G's, your big daddy Kane's, you know, your YZ's and all those kind of guys, amazing. You know, so, you know, thanks for paving the way for us lot. Absolutely, I'm glad you mentioned chill Rob G because he doesn't get mentioned enough. Um, he's somebody definitely who me and Craig G used to drive around New York City listening to Chill Rob G's album, just like amazed at the the lyrics, the lines, the wordplay. Like we would just like play his album over and over and over again. That ride the with him, like just nonstop. So I'm glad you mentioned him. Bro, if I start a, a little rhyme, can you carry it on? Can we carry it on together even? I don't know. Oh, you mean from Chill Rob? Yeah, it's whack to me when the beat is more hype than the MC, because what he's saying is empty. 
dull, void, without substance or content. You need to slow your speed, stop the nonsense. These are the words of the rising sun, surprising some who thought I was just another humdrum, average type of MC. <laughs> You're killing it. Yeah, you, 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 you got me. I, I absolutely remember the record, but damn, like you, you got it locked in. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. I, I would have to get reacclimated with 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 that album, but absolutely. Um, I'm hearing the beat as you're saying that. I'm like, ooh, yeah, I remember this very very much. So, Chill Rob is a guy. Is that is that guy? Tell us a little bit about growing up in Brownsville. When I look back at with with nostalgic eyes, I feel like I had a really fun childhood. I feel like my neighborhood was like a playground. We had so much fun in my immediate neighborhood. Brownsville is a big place, but when I say my neighborhood, like I, I lived in this this particular housing project called Howard Houses, and there were three buildings that kind of made up what I call my neighborhood. It's my building, which is 260, and then it was the building right next door, which was uh, 280. That's where Steady Pace lived, and 270 was the other building. Those three buildings were like faced each other, and so more or less. So. There were way more buildings in that housing project, but kind of like that, th those three buildings was like our community. So when we played baseball or football or basketball, like it was pretty much, we were interacting with the people from those buildings, the different games that we played. We had, there's a multitude of games um, that we played. Um, the, the biggest of which was a, a game called, we called it freeze tag, but it actually wasn't freeze tag. It was like free tag, but, but basically, my building was home base. We had like a little stoop and that was home base. Like if you, if you got caught, because basically what it was was like kind of like a game of tag. So there'd be like a team of three or four and then it'd be like 50 kids. And so the team of three or four would have to go out and basically manhunt, which was another game we played, manhunt and find all of the kids, tag them, and then they had to come back and basically be in jail or on this base. And so this team of four would leave one person back to kind of guard the guard the base to make sure that nobody comes to try to free everybody. So three guys, three people are out chasing everybody, trying to tag and get them, get them put back onto the base. And then one person is trying to guard it. But when I, I can't even describe to you the level of fun and excitement when somebody snuck in and got to free everybody. Cause you jumped on the thing and you said free. And then literally you have 40 kids running every which direction. <laughs> and that game kind of summed up what growing up in Brownsville was like for me. The the amount of fun and excitement that that we had from such a simple game with no, it didn't require any tools, any it was no ball, there was none. It was just your your body and the building, and that's the, those are the types of games that we played. I would love to sit down with some of the people from my old neighborhood who are now in their fifties, forties, fifties, sixties, even. And just ask them, do they remember those games? Because I know they all do, because it was so much fun. I mean, obviously, it's obvious that the world has changed now and everyone's stuck on their devices and stuff. I mean, do you feel like they're missing that kind of youth that we had where we used to just grab the simplest toy and hit the streets of football, uh, baseball or whatever in your situation, in your case? The kids the, the kids are locked in, indoors now. They're locked, they're locked indoors and they're locked with their heads down looking at their devices. Um, they have no concept of the, of, of the fun that can be had without having these, 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 these tools at their fingertips. Um, but that's us, that's our jobs as parents to kind of try to show that and teach that. And if, if we do a good job of, um, keeping our kids not so engaged in the, the devices that they get a chance to understand what else is out there and how else that, how there are many other ways to enjoy life. That's our individual jobs as parents across the board. If you had grown up in a time with devices and stuff, what kind of MC would you have turned out to be today? I think it probably would have affected my imagination a little bit because I had to use my imagination in a lot of cases to create these scenarios, these worlds, on these songs. Um, it was either through life experience or through my imagination. And in most cases, it was just through my imagination. But with the device, I feel like you have you have ideas and, and the world kind of at your fingertips. So it, it would really, I think it would make you a little bit more lazy. Like it's kind of like when we look at what, what um, you know, what this AI stuff is doing now where 
people are you using AI to like write video treatments and things of that nature. Like that is dumbing down our creativity. It's dumbing down our ability to think for ourselves. And, and that's a little scary. With that in mind, if you were one of these guys that was in a, in a position to be sitting in an office and make some decisions that could help artists kind of nurture their way into the life that we're in now, what would you do different? I would have a boot camp. I would have an artist boot camp where you had to go away for, you know, two weeks. Um, it would be a writer's boot camp. There would be no TV. There would be no devices. There would be a studio up there, but I would I would really challenge these artists to create from a from a from a from a blank slate. Um, only only writing about life experiences. Um, and really, really, really put them through the ringer so that they could understand how to get to that, how to find that creative place. Because um, most of the young kids, they're just kind of just writing what they hear other people saying, and they just focused on just, oh, well, this sound, this is what everybody's buying, or this is what's playing played on the radio. So I'm going to say stuff that sounds like this, and it kind of really, it, it really does to me drown out the the level of creativity that we should be having, especially in, in these advanced times. These kids should be super creative and they're less creative than we were, which makes no sense. You know what, at this point, I'd like to make a suggestion and say when, when we're teaching the kids about the creativity, they need to have a list of MCs that they have to listen to and they have no choice. And in that list has got to be you. I appreciate it, man. The, the, the boot camp idea, let's, let's, let's keep that idea alive. I would love to do something like that. It, it'd actually be a, a good reality TV show too. Maybe you just stumbled on something. So now you just need to find the investors and, and get moving, right? And some decent rappers. Have you heard any rappers in this day and age now that you think are decent? Yeah, I don't, what I don't do is compare today's rappers to like early Rakim, early Kane, early LL. Like, I don't, I don't do that because it's a different bar. Um, the bar that was created back then was one bar that Kane and Rakim and LL and Chill Rob G, those guys created a bar. Um, and it was the job of everybody that came after them to try to reach that bar and leap, leap over that bar and, and take it to the next level. I don't think it's fair to compare a 23 year old rapper now to, to Rakim. It's just, it's, 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 it's apples and oranges to me. Um, I would ha we would have to compare him to his contemporaries to really be able to, to, to judge him. Um, so I remember, I, there's, there's a, there's a rapper named Simba who's, who's, who's from, I believe from the West coast, uh, LA, who's, who's, who's excellent. Sci high to Prince, who I believe if I'm not mistaken is from Atlanta. Um, I'm going to I'm going to always mention Kendrick and J. Cole in that conversation. Um, my daughter put me on to Corday, who I didn't know anything about. She put me on to him and I was like, oh, this kid can really rap. Um, you know, she's a huge Corday fan. Jack Harlow, somebody else who I wasn't aware of. My daughter made me aware of him. Another another excellent artist. There's plenty of young talent out there that's putting down some nice, nice lyrics. Big Sean, who, who has a lot of radio hits. But he doesn't get mentioned for his, his his actual lyricism, which which is excellent. Like he should, he people just view him as a, a radio artist. But Big Sean is is nice. Like we use that word when we say somebody is nice. That means they they get busy. Big Sean is nice. Um, the list goes on. I'm, these are just off the top of my head. I probably named seven, eight guys, but there's there's probably another 10, 15 that I'm at the moment not thinking of that are excellent. Yeah, of course. Obviously, while I was building up to doing this interview with you, I was going back and listening to some of your material and everything and also doing the research on your background and everything. And in one of the interviews, they were mentioned about the crack pandemic that was going, the epidemic that was going on in your neighborhood. How did that affect you? The crack epidemic happened literally, the, it, 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 it took hold of the neighborhood while I was away at college. So I literally like left for college in 84, fall of 84, I was away to college. So 84, 85, 86, 87, 88 was when everything was happening. Like it was, it was, it was, 
so I was coming back from college, not really plus plus at that point, like halfway through high school, um we moved to Flatbush. So I wasn't my grandmother still lived in Brownsville, but I wasn't there. I wasn't a regular resident in the projects anymore. I would go I would go see her on the weekends or whenever I have free time. But it wasn't like I was there on a day to day. So I was getting I was getting the info and the intel on what was happening in the neighborhood, you know, through friends that who still live there. Um, and it was almost like playing catch up, like, oh, what's up with such and such? Um, I, I just I just saw his mom's and his, his his mom's looks like she's homeless. This is like somebody we grew up with whose mother was a working woman, you know, had a great life raising her children. And I come back after three years and she's walking around like a zombie. And I'm, 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 that was, that was how it hit me. I didn't see the, I didn't get to see it as it was happening. I saw things being one way. I go away to college. I come back. Things are a whole nother way. And people who were regular folk in the neighborhood, you know, being um, productive members of society, all of a sudden, are walking around with holes in their clothes, dirty faces, and you know, looking scratching and looking like they, you know, have no home. And that was it was it it was shocking to say the least. When you're talking about friends, mothers, you know, you know, people who let you into their homes, and now you see the destruction of an entire family, the mother, the sisters, the brothers, everybody just gone. Um so probably because I was away at school, I didn't feel the impact of it the way people who are living it every day did, but I definitely saw the results of it um, almost like night and day within a matter of three to four years, seeing people who I knew one way who, who now seemed like so they were out of their minds. Um, it, it affected me profoundly because I, I took it and I I took what I was experiencing and I tried to express it as much as I could in that first album, my first debut album, Take a Look Around. There's a lot of things in that album that are influenced by what I saw when I got back from college. Do you think if you were in the neighborhood when all this was going on, we would never have heard of Master Race? Was there any chance that you might have got caught up in that? Nah, there was no chance. Why are you so confident of that? Because my family life, like I had love. I, there was love in my household. I had my mother, I had my grandmother. Um, they took, they took, they kept an eye on me. They, they, they looked out for me. They made sure that I was on the right path. They made, they made it understood to me that, you know, education was super important and paramount to everything that I want to do in my life. And so there was never a thought to go a different route for me, um, but I had close friends who who went the street route, who went the criminal route. Uh, one of my best friends, you know, decided that he was gonna start robbing people um, with, with, a, with a group of other guys. And the, the day that he made that decision to start to go start trying, you know, go out and start robbing people, I had, I had the option. I had the option, I was asked, yo, you wanna come with us? And something in me, said, and this is my best friend, something in me said, no, I'm good. I'm going to stay here and keep playing ball like we was doing. And he went to, with those guys and that's what they started. They literally started a life of crime that day. Um, and he and I, from that day, became further and further apart. We didn't hang as much until to the point where we didn't hang at all. And I went to high school. He went to jail. It was almost like hand in hand. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I don't think I would have ever gotten caught up in that um, because that was that was the way I was wired from the teachings of my mother, grandmother. And my I'll have to credit my eighth grade teacher, Mrs. Fulton, as well. She was a key component to to that mindset. The reason I asked that question is because obviously you said that there was a lady that, you know, she wasn't basically that way driven, but she ended up on the streets and ended up looking homeless and like she was on something. So that crack epidemic that was going on, it can catch anybody. It doesn't matter how, how organized and together you are. So what I'm trying to portray is the kind of person that you are 
that didn't allow that to get to you. Right. Like, I mean, a lot of the people who got caught up with that epidemic, they were already like weed smokers because people, a lot of people were casual, you know, weed smokers. I wasn't. I didn't, I didn't smoke. Um, some of my friends did. I didn't smoke. So if you smoked, if you smoked weed and you liked weed in those days, like getting high and somebody, you know, when crack first came out, it wasn't, it wasn't understood as this like dangerous drug that was, that could, that could rip your life away. It rip your life into shreds. It wasn't viewed that way. It was just like the new, the new little, the new cool thing, like weed, it's just a little bit, a little bit different, but it's the same thing. So there were actually songs about crack when, when, when it first came out, there was a, there was a song called crack it up. I don't know if you ever heard this. Song yeah. Yeah. Before. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So, so crack it up was a, was basically a, a crack celebratory crack song that came out in, I want to say 80. Hmm. It came out like 80, 45. Something like that, and because we weren't familiar with what it really was or what it was about to do to the community, we were just thinking, "Oh, this is another cool song." I remember us playing playing that song on on our little radio, going on our way to Coney Island to go, you know, check out the girls. So, yeah, this is this is what was happening at, at that time. But but because I wasn't into even smoking weed, I don't see that. I don't think there was any way I was going to get caught up. For some of us, we just thought, ah, college, university, I ain't going to learn nothing. I'm just going to start rapping or being a footballer or whatever. But you actually saw your college days through. Uh, what put you in that direction to go, right, even though I've got so much faith in what I do as a rapper, maybe you didn't at the time because you went to college first, but what kept you on that path? You could have easily gone down that path and gone, I'm making records, that's it, I don't care about school. What kept you on the path of school? My mother. And and to be honest with you, there was no, at that time, the idea of making rap or music a career wasn't a thing. It wasn't at all, it wasn't an option that you even considered because it hadn't really, it wasn't really happening yet. There were a few people, there were a few records out. Yeah, there's a few rappers that had songs out, but the idea of, oh, I'm going to actually go and turning this into a career that wasn't that wasn't a realistic thought so it was not on my radar at all i wasn't thinking like do i want to go to college or do i want to do this music thing it, it wasn't that at all it was college get your degree when you graduate start you know put together a resume start looking for a job that's literally what the path was um and that's where that's what that's where my head was and then and then the, the the rap contest happened. I meet Marley Mall, and then it takes another turn. But but it was almost like fate sent me in that direction. It wasn't me pursuing music like I'm gonna be. A, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make records for a living. That wasn't. That was never my thought. Yeah, that's why I called it in the introduction a beautiful accident, because you know it's one of those moments where there was no predicting it, was it? It just happened. Right. I was definitely not looking for that. I didn't expect it to turn into what it turned into. I didn't t definitely didn't expect it to turn into a 35-year career. Then, obviously, you like you just mentioned, you linked up with Marley Marl um, after the competition, the battle, and everything started taking a different turn. Do you want to explain that accident and how it felt to be involved in something purely by chance and to know that you got guys like Big Daddy Kane and Craig G and, you know, Coogee Rap and... All that basically going, yo, keep him on here, keep him on here. When you're in the middle of of something like that, you don't you don't have the consciousness to to step back and go, wow, this is happening, this is this is crazy. Like you're just you're just going with the moment, right? You're going with the flow of 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 what's happening. So my sophomore year in college, my second year in college, I heard about a rap contest. My boy Scooter Rockwell told me about that he was going to go into this contest if I wanted to go. I agreed to go with him, jumped on the train, went up there. You know, I'm I'm programming my the drum his drum machine. He had a doctor rhythm. I'm programming that so that so that the beat can match up with the lyrics and the lines that I'm saying so the beat will drop out on the on the right lines and then come back in. And so I'm pro, I'm at literally planning my whole set on my way to this contest. Um end up winning the contest and they say your first prize is six hours of studio time uh, with Marley Mall. 
Um, and so I'm like, okay, great. I don't know what that means, but I'm I'm definitely gonna ca- try to cash in on my time. So I had never been to a studio before. Um, I had never tried to record a professional song before. I, you know, just stuff we did in the house with, you know, making tapes, but never like a studio where your voice is like going onto a tape. I had never done that before. Um, finally, finally caught up with Marley like three, four months after I won the contest. Finally got 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 the got the right number, the right phone number. Got in touch with him and went to his house to record my first session. Um, that day, he told me to meet him in Queensbridge uh, Projects. I never been to Queensbridge Projects in, a day in my life. Took the train out there. Was sitting on the bench in front of the building or next to the building where he said to meet him. Um, and up walks a young Craig G, about 14, 15 years old. Introduces himself. Um, he just immediately assumed we were waiting for Marley because he said, he told me that day that yeah, rap Marley always has rappers out here waiting for him. So he sat and he sat and talked with me in steady pace for probably an hour, like just kind of just talking about different things, music and this and that. And he's younger than us, but he was pretty, I would say he was mature for his age. You know, I didn't know at the time he was that young, 14 or whatever, but he was able to, you know, have a conversation with us. We're in our twenties. Um, so he went on his way. Um, eventually Molly came home quite late actually. Um, and I went up and I recorded my first demo. Um, and I don't think Molly had any intentions on going past the six hours, but it must've been something about what, what he heard from the, from the few demos that we recorded in those six hours. There must've been something that he heard that made him want me to keep coming back. So he asked me to keep coming back. and then. Um, so I would, whenever I had school breaks, I would come back and record, but then, um, at the, at the end of my senior year, he said he was doing a compilation album and he wanted to use two of the songs we did for the compilation album. I I signed some kind of contract right on his kitchen table. Um, and I got an opportunity to be on his album, Marley Marley in Control. I remember sitting in, in my producer's, um, room where he had his studio, he was in his house. And whenever he was telling me like, Blade, this is what you need to do. And he was playing stuff that Marley was doing, but he was playing your things, Letter to the Better and, you know what I'm saying, Music Man and all that. And obviously we're recording at this time. So it wasn't just that I as an MC was seeing you as an inspiration, but my producer was hearing something in you. So you, you had an impact in a big way to not just rappers, but to producers as well. That's crazy. I mean, I didn't produce anything at that. I, I wasn't, I didn't know how to produce. I knew, I knew what I wanted to rap over. And I, w- I wouldn't learn until years later that what I, essentially what I was doing was co-producing my, my songs. But, you know, um, at that time, I didn't know how to work any of the equipment. Um, I had no idea how anything worked. I just knew how to rap and I knew what I wanted to rap over. So, I would I would I would go to Molly's house with ideas. I I, I would come with a bag of of records I, that I got from my mother's record collection, maybe twenty five records. I would take to Molly's house and I would show him, yo, I want to rap on this piece right here. Play the piece for him, and he would do his magic. You know, put his drums on it, turn it into he would turn it into a song. But I definitely went up there in my in those early years with all my most of my ideas already kind of planned out what I wanted to rap over. With the records that actually did come out, did you pick any of the loops and stuff to be used and Marley just kind of added the production to it? Yes. Uh I can almost tell you every single one. It's it's, it's, it's a little bit more than ha- it's a little a little bit more than half the album. Um Brooklyn Battles, Brooklyn Battles um was from my mom's collection. Um Letter to the Better was a record that I got from a friend. Um, it was it was Marley's idea to speed it up to 45, I will say that, um, which made it what it was. Who came up with the idea for I Got To? Mr. C came out with that beat, he played it for me, and I was like, I like this, but I gotta figure out how I'm gonna rap around this repeated I Got To. There's gotta be a way to, I, I it, didn't, it didn't make sense to rap right over it, it was just too much noise. So I'll just let I'll let the I got to fill in part of the bar each each line, and so I was off and running. But C produced that joint. C produced 
three joints on the album. He produced that. He produced um he produced um um Post and High. And he produced Can't Stop the Bum Rush. Those are the three that Mr. C produced. Um and I'm trying to remember all the rest of the loops. I, I would have to look at the the track listing to to go through. Cause I did it. I did it recently. I I pulled out the track list and I was just like, let me see how many of these joints were Jack joints that I brought to Marley to 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 rap over. And between the the joints, the three that Mr. C produced, the one that my guy Unique produced, and the maybe four or five loops that I brought, it was a little bit more than half the album. But that's not to take anything away from Marley. Yeah, of course. But you know, you just said that recently. You looked at the album again. How did that make you feel? I mean, it was cool to know how much I contributed to the project. I mean, Molly did give me, he did give me co-producers credit on the album, which he hadn't done. Up to that point, he hadn't done that with any of the people that he worked with. I think he kind of realized with his relation, the way his relationship with Biz and then ultimately with Kane, the way those relationships went, where they started just producing for themselves, I think he realized that he it was the right thing to do would be to give credit to what credit was due. And just like myself, Biz was bringing loops to Marley's house, and Big Daddy Kane was bringing him and Mr. C were bringing loops to Marley's house. Marley was hooking them up and putting his putting his you know his flavor on it. But he should have been those records should have probably said. Pro- Co-produced by Biz Marquis, co-produced by Big Daddy Kane, Mr. C. And you mentioned that there were some demos that you'd done in that six hours that you were there. Have any of these demos been heard by the public? Not by the public. Um, two, two of them were on in control. But there's a couple of joints that never saw the light of day. I had, I had a joint called uh, Power Move that never came out. I had a joint called Howard Park that Marley played on the radio twice maybe on BLS, but then never it never it never was a record. Um I had a, I had a I had a I had probably it's probably joints I don't even remember, but it's probably like six five, six different songs recorded during that time period that never nobody ever heard. Are you gonna release them at any point? I don't even have those records. I don't even Marley has all that stuff. Yeah, I don't even have them. Back then it wasn't like it was it wasn't customary to necessarily take like a copy of what you did because you know we're going to come back and fix it anyway so i wasn't i didn't i didn't learn till a, a few years later like take take it home listen to it refine it come back i would record stuff and then leave and so you know maybe maybe he has that stuff somewhere in his storage unit or something like that but I haven't heard. I can't even remember all the songs. I remember. I remember Power Move because that was the joint that I actually played for guys up at up, up at my college, and they reminded me about that song. But there was a couple other joints that I can't think of. So when you were in college, did people know that you were an MC? They did. And how how was the reaction? How did they treat you? I mean, they would. It was definitely like a little bit of hoopla around it, but more so because because there was a so at my school I went to the University of Rhode Island and the radio station on campus was WRIU. So I was I was basically drawn to that station. Something I wanted to be up there. So I started going up there every day during the after during the after classes. And there was a guy named BJ the DJ that was play hip hop. And so I would come up there, kind of help out, and then I would he would let me rap on the on the air. So that was like my first time like really like rapping even though it was college radio, it didn't go far. But, you know, it was like within you know, probably like a 10-mile radius, 20-mile radius or something like that. But people started knowing me for rapping on the college station. And that was when, this was before anything. And then when I won the contest, mind you, I'm still in school. So I'm, I won the contest. I'm coming back telling everybody, you are into this contest. I won. I'm going to be recording with Marley Mall. And I and I actually had a copy of the contest on a cassette. So I started playing it for people at the, at the campus. They started passing it around, making copies. So I was kind of like people started talking about me around campus because of this, this this contest. And a couple of the demos started circulating around the campus too. 
And I think we might play one of the demos on this on the college station at the time as well. But yeah, I mean, but it wasn't like there was no videos out. There was no, you know, it was just records, music, records. But it wasn't until Symphony dropped. And when Symphony dropped, I was already graduated from college. So um there was no video. So it wasn't like a big, big deal, but it was like kind of cool on campus. Oh, he rap, yeah, he's pretty good. The one thing that always gets me is like people always see when Say you make your appearance in 1988, but a lot went on before that to lead to that moment. A lot. Right. So do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the things that went on before? Like, when did it all begin? What happened in between? I mean, we know how you linked up with Marley, but just a little bit before that. So a little bit before that, I, uh, well, I'm still in high school. We had a, we had a, a rap group called the Come Alive Five. And we entered, we entered the, the school talent show. It was five of us on stage. We all had on the leather blazers like Run DMC and Adidas. Like we were literally dressed like Run DMC. Did you wear the shell toes? Absolutely. And all five of us were on the football team. So we were we were already pretty popular in the school. So it stands to reason that we would win because all the girls liked us. We were football players and we were rapping pretty good. So we won we won the contest um during during that same school year because of probably partially because of the contest word got around that there was a couple of rappers up at our school that was supposed to be pretty good so some guys came up from another school to battle us to battle me specifically or maybe maybe to battle us and i stepped up and said i got this and i battled this guy i don't even know what school dude was from and we sat we, we stood out in front of the school for about probably two hours or something like that battling going back and forth with the with the bars and the verses and this and that and you know um but those are kind of like the early early years of me understanding that this is what it takes to really prove yourself this is how you this is the testing ground you got to be willing to go go against anybody at any at any moment like this guy's showing up at my school after school don't know anybody he's showing up with his crew of guys and they want to battle and those were the early those were the early testing ground years and I, I i got through those um definitely held my own um my guy ice was in that battle too they had a couple guys and we were just back and forth and it was it was it was a good battle i don't remember much about it but i i know we didn't lose you know what i mean but um those were those were the early testing ground years and um and being up in my boy rodney's crib um in my building he lives on the ninth floor I'm on the seventh floor, but he had more freedom than some of us. So we were able to keep all the music equipment in his house and we were able to play music and DJ and play the music dumb loud because his mom worked all the time. His father was never home. So we would put the giant speaker up to his window, his bedroom window, and we would we would just cut and scratch and play break beats and play good times and disco joints. And you know, th that those were the early years of me kind of trying to find my place in, in, in this hip hop thing. Do you remember what got you started? It was those DJ days um, at, at Rodney's crib, going to his crib, making tapes. Cause I started off DJing, all of us were just DJs and making tapes. We, we would make tapes, we, we, we would DJ for two hours straight, record, record everything that we did. Then we would go outside with a radio playing the tapes that we just made. And basically what we were doing was emulating what we heard coming from places like the Bronx, other parts of Queens. We were hearing other DJs doing this, so we wanted to make the same kind of tapes. Eventually, the tapes that we started hearing started to have rapping on them. Cats were starting to rap at, over these breakbeats and stuff. And so none of us at the time rapped. So I kind of took it upon myself because I was kind of good at poetry. I took it upon myself that I was going to try to put together a couple of lines, you know, to so our, our tapes could sound more 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 finished. So it was I was the first in the crew to really start trying to write rhymes or raps specifically for these tapes, and I kind of would take what I heard other rappers doing on those other tapes. I would take what they were doing, change a couple of words, put my name in it you know, make it my own, but it was really based on somebody else's lines. Um, and that's how it started for me. 
and then the term and then the term biting you know sort of came into the forefront and it's like oh can't be a biter what's biting like when you take somebody else's thing i'm like oh okay so now i gotta do my completely do my own thing okay got it and then i started trying to create my own my own lines i think um everyone that's emceed in those days probably did the same thing that's how you learn anyone that i know that was into hip-hop back in the days dabbled in all aspects of hip-hop right so whether it was the graffiti or the b-boying or whatever so i know i did that did you do that or did you just stick with the rhyming all of it i did all of it i did all of it before rhyming i was we used to pop uh, um we call it popping electric boogie is another term but we call it popping um so i started off pop, that was the first thing i did was popping um dancing and so we would battle at swim at the swimming pool in my projects we would battle dudes at popping and at the swimming pool and then i had a in that same contest that i mentioned before where we entered as a rap group i entered that that same contest separately as a dance crew with me steady pace Rodney, who I mentioned, and one other guy, the four of us, and we we entered as dancers, poppers. I believe we won as well. Um, so I did that first. Then I started DJing. Then I discovered Graph. I discovered Graph on the, coming home from school one day, and. I was well. Actually, how I discovered Graph was a documentary called um, uh, "Style Wars." Everybody's familiar with that documentary, so it's not that. That's not actually how I discovered Graph. That's how I started paying attention to Graph after seeing that documentary. The next time I rode the train, I was reading every name. I was like so intrigued by this culture, this subculture. And so I started, you know, writing down all of the names that I would see on the train, like the ones that I would see the most. I would just, I had a book with like maybe two, 300 names. Every every writer's name, I would just write them down, write them down. Then I said, I'm going to pick my own name. So I started just, I bought a peace book. I started doing little, you know, stuff with magic markers and stuff in the peace book. And I would bring it to, I would bring it to school when I was in high school. There was another guy on the team, on a football team that was a little bit more advanced than me with the graffiti. He showed me his peace book. I'm like, ooh, he he's way better than me. But that was all of that was before I started rapping on these on these tapes and discovering rapping. I did all of that first. Like I said, all of anybody that I know that was in hip hop in the early days dabbled in everything until they figured out this is what I'm best at. Let me stick to this. Right. Yeah, exactly. I I in my DJ crew, there was five of us, I think, in the crew. And I was maybe like fourth best. Um, out of the guys that was deep, that was DJs, and w once the once the Transformer scratch came out, I I, I retired because I could not figure, <laughs> I could not do it. So so, how do you look at people like Cash Money and you know them guys? Insane to me, it's insane. Like um, I I'm amazed by it. I respect, I res I because I did it before. I understand that the stuff that they're doing and how difficult it is. So I have nothing but the utmost respect for. You know that level of turntablism, um, because I know I know what it I know what it requires, and I know that I can't I never got to that point. Sure, if I probably worked super duper hard, but Steady, Steady was super nice. He was like way better than everybody, so it didn't even matter. I, I knew I wasn't gonna catch him, and I'm like, if I'm not gonna be better than Steady, then why am I doing this? Let me let me do something else. So I started making making rhymes. You know, you just. Um said steady and that just kind of triggered something with regards to the conversation that we had earlier about the crack epidemic and the criminal activity that was going on and for me it was really sad to see that steady b was caught up in something do you remember that yeah a bank robbery i remember that yeah i mean i'm talking about steady pace though yeah yeah, yeah i know i know that but i'm just saying that's why i said okay. steady and yeah. i was a big fan yeah, yeah, of steady yeah. b and i was like uh that was disappointing oh we all we all were yeah we all were the reason why for me it was disappointing was because it's like here's this guy that's incredibly talented and the music is in pain that he has to go and do something like that you know so it wasn't like i was even disappointed that he did that cuz i've thought about doing stuff like that but just the fact that the industry doesn't really create the opportunities in the way we believe it will for all of us and people that deserve it. So you end up doing something that 
you know, it's not really the path to go. There's a lot of artists over the years that have rapped about a lifestyle that they actually want to live in. What do you think about that? I mean, that's why I try to be as real as I can on my songs. I try to be genuine, um, authentic with the stuff I write about. I know that it makes no sense to write about a lifestyle. That I, just be truthful in everything you write, and, and the rest of it will work itself out. The idea that, you know, you got you got kids that are, you know, 20, 20 years old, and their songs, they're rapping about Maybox and, you know, millions of dollars and diamonds and all this type of stuff. And they live with their mother and their mother buys their sneakers. Like, you know what I mean? Like, come on, what are we, what are we, what are we doing? Like, but they think that they have to rap about that in order to be, in order to be accepted. And that's a shame that you would rather portray yourself as something you're not to be accepted. Not, not believing that you, if you just rap and be honest about who you are, that people would accept you. You should you should expect people to accept you for who for who you are. But that's what I always when I talk to young artists. That's what I'm always trying to tell them. Because they, what kind of advice can you give me? Be who you are. Stop trying to stop trying to rap and be something to rap about stuff that you don't know nothing about. Can we just go back to the symphony? I, I know obviously how you got onto the track. You've already kind of uh, touched on it and everything. But when I was watching the video back in the days, I remember Big Daddy Kane wasn't in the lineup that walked in through the bar. Why was that? Yeah, he was supposed to be there. He was actually there initially when we were about to shoot. Um, but then there was some sort of um, problem locally with, 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 the, with a police situation. So he actually left right before we started filming that scene. We, th we thought that he was gonna be coming back at some point, but he ended up missing the entire shoot because he had to go talk to answer a bunch of questions and stuff like that. So we missed, we actually missed him being in that part of the video, which is why we had to shoot it separately on another day. I just thought maybe he thought he was better than all of you lot and decided not. Nah, nah, <laughs> nah, it was nothing like that. It was nothing like that. Yeah, no, I was just joking when I said that, by the way. People did think that though. People were like, oh, he too good to wear the cowboy hat. Like, nah, it was nothing like that. He was there. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish somebody had, they should have had a photographer at least on set to capture that day. Like, it's crazy to me that there was no, well, maybe there's pictures that I've never seen, but you would think that there would be a photographer there to kind of get a picture of all of us bef before that scene was shot. I know you've, you've discussed it in other interviews, um, but you talk about me and the biz. I was actually surprised that people thought that was biz i'm like what i was like i don't sound like biz i changed my voice yeah a little bit so that but to me i didn't sound like biz but it was like it's, it's it surprises me that to this day that there's still people that i meet that don't know that that's not biz on the song which is crazy to me we found out pretty early that it wasn't biz so we we were aware but at the time we just thought biz sounded a little bit different. We didn't even know that you were beatboxing and stuff as well. So when you did that, it was a bit like raw. Everybody got a little beatboxing in them. Everybody can do a little something. Yeah, but you sounded like biz as well. Marley probably did something to boost it up my, 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 he probably did something to make it sound official. I don't know. I don't know what he did. Magic. Cold chilling. I mean, you, you were on that. You know, you know, on the label. I mean, I remember going to see Cold Chillin' in 1988 at Brixton Academy, and I was backstage, and I, I met everybody, and you weren't there at the time. If it's the tour I'm thinking of, um, it was Biz, it was Biz, Kane, Shan, G-Rap, uh, Shan, Shantae. Shantae. That's it. Yeah. No Craig, no Craig. So when that tour, were you, you said that was 88? 88, Brixton Academy. I wasn't officially down yet when that tour happened. Um, I had just graduated from college. If you, if, you, if you tell me what month it was, I can even probably tell you. They probably, was it, was it in the summer? Do you remember the time of year? I think it may have been April, you know. If it was April 88, I was still at college. I hadn't even, I hadn't even, I hadn't even signed the contract to be on Marley Marley Control yet. But I did see video, there, there's, a, there's video footage of that tour that they did over in the UK. 
And I, I remember G Rap. I remember in one of the videos, G Rap had a bunch of English pounds. And he was like, yo, I got mad pounds. You know what I'm saying? I got mad pounds. Um, I remember that. And I remember, I just remember seeing footage of those performances in the UK. Kane was, Kane's album wasn't even out yet. His album wasn't even out yet. So, yeah, I wasn't down yet. So, I wouldn't have been there. I hadn't met those guys yet. I'd only met Marley and Craig at that point, maybe, and Shan. Those are the only three people I met at that point. Have you ever um, compromised a project? Compromised? Yeah, like one of your albums or one of your singles. Did you feel like you were doing something that you didn't necessarily want to do? The, the, sitting, on, the sitting on Chrome album was my compromise. Why is that? Because Delicious Vinyl, they, they, they saw the success of Born to Roll. They really felt like if I could give them a full car culture uh project that they could you know take it to gold platinum like they 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 strongly urged me to like make a car culture album like you don't they were like you don't understand like people are loving you because it is one song like do do a few more of these joints like do an album dedicated to this audience and you're gonna be out of here now at that time delicious vinyl they had great success with with tone loke with young mc they were both of those artists were platinum and i'm looking at it like well maybe this is my chance to finally you know get a platinum plaque on the wall so i'm going to try to give them what they're asking me for but also keep try to keep my creative integrity at the same time so i blended together what they were asking for and what i wanted to do and that's what became the sitting on chrome album um had they not asked me to do that Sitting on Chrome album probably wouldn't have even been called Sitting on Chrome. Songs like INC Ride and Sitting on Chrome would have never been made. Um, it would have been a completely different project. And for all we know, that could have, you know, whatever songs I would have made instead of those songs, that might have been what really made me, you know, go gold or go platinum. But trying to follow the label, trying to follow their lead. I figure, you know, they kind of know what they're doing in terms of how to sell a record. So I'm going to give them what they want. And, you know, if it doesn't work, I just know I'll never do it again. In the introduction, I said, um, in my humble opinion, that you are the most consistent MC, in, in my opinion, yeah? Because you've always stuck to your guns. You've never tried to be somebody different. You've never um, strayed from the path that you were on. And just like everything has been, if you know Ace from... 1988, that's the same guy now. You know, the consistency of who you are has never changed. Well, oh, thanks. Um, Thank you. How do you maintain that? I mean, I think it's having a sense of integrity and having a sense of self, knowing who you are at your core and being able to express that to audiences just be, by being true, by being true and being honest about who you are, what you represent. I think that I think that stands out to people because they're so used to rappers just kind of talking about whatever the su superficial topics of the moment are and, and not talking about real life things. Um, and sure, there's tons of hip hop fans who they don't care about real life. They want to, they want the fantasy. They want to hear about champagne and fancy cars and designer clothes. And that's their escape. Um, for for some for for a lot of fans like what I do, making them think a little bit too much. People, a lot of people don't want that. They don't want to think. I don't want to think. I just want to listen to music. I want to dance to the beat, and I want to escape. Um, and so, I think what I do might be a little bit too too much reality for some people. So they 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 steer away from what I do and they focus on the superficial stuff because it's easier to digest. It's less thinking involved. And that's fine too, you know. I'm 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 content that my fans are more thinkers, more deep thinkers, because um, that's what I am. So, let's give them something that might not be easy for them to digest. Two thousand, you suffered with MS. I was diagnosed, yes. Right. So you were diagnosed with MS. I watched your video when it came out with Pharaoh, Pharaoh Munch. Fight song. Yeah. Oh my God, bro. The lyricism in that is just like, first of all, obviously the role that Pharaoh played was incredible. And then the fact that you're yeah. fighting back and everything, whose idea was that? The idea for that song was 
a guy named Paul Barman. Um, you might remember Paul from my Disposable Arts skits. He's he's my roommate, Paul from Paul from Saskatchewan. But he's actually an MC. He's actually an MC and artist. He's dropped albums and all of that. But he was actually the one who approached me about doing a song with the, with that as the topic with 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 one rapper being the disease and mess and me rapping about like basically a battle between me and MS, but one of the, the, the MS is another MC. And I think when he presented me with the idea, he was thinking that he was going to be the MC that embodied um, the disease. But at the time, first of all, at the time, I wasn't sure if I even had a beat that, that lent itself to that kind of topic because it was such a heavy topic. Um, and we went back, me and Marco went back and listened, listened to some of the older beats that he had given me. One of them kind of, I thought, worked. But I, I had him restructure it completely. And um, we started thinking about who could really, really deliver this rhyme. And Pharaoh was at the top of the list of people that we thought could pull it off. So we, we sent it out to him. He loved it. Um, we sent him the version with my verse already down because I knew I was going to rhyme second. Whoever was going to rhyme first had to be. Whoever was going to be MS had to romp first. That was that was how I I envisioned the song structure going. So sent it to him. He loved it. He obviously killed killed the concept. And you know, Paul Paul wasn't mad. He he never officially said, "Yo, let me do it." But I knew he was egg, egging it in that direction. But once he heard that I got Farrell, he's like, "Yo, I get it. I totally get it." I don't think you could have got anyone better. You know. You know, like when you get like Terminator, and there is no one that can play it. Arnold Schwarzenegger is the guy. You know, so Pharaoh was that guy on that track. He's just unbelievable. The, the, the best conceptual guy you could have got, really. Exactly. And there's a line in there um, that you say, um, I'm just trying to find it. I've got it written down here in front of me. So, so you say, um, you might slow me a little bit, but you won't stop me. You might stand in my pathway, but you won't block me. Way back when you didn't know me, I rode sloppy. Tend to write with the inner fight of a broke Rocky. It's that bit, the broke Rocky bit. What about it? When you watch the movies and you see how broke Rocky was. So what level of broke did you get to? Where did the strength come from to fight this and go, yo, I'm not going to let you beat me? A lot of it came from my wife. Um, she, she, when she got, when, when we got the news, like her, her attitude about it was so positive and so like, this is nothing. Like, um. I probably would have been like more on some depressed stuff and moping around for a few years. What was me and all of that? But she, her, her, her attitude was so positive that it made me kind of like rethink where, where I was going with it in my head, and that was that was super helpful. Um, and it it got me on the path. First, it got me on the path of trying to figure out how how did I get this? How, how what what caused this? I started doing a bunch of research and you know f figured out. In, in, at least from from the research that I did, I figured out that it was probably related to foods that I was eating or had been eating over the course of my life. It had a lot to do with it. So I immediately started making dietary changes over the course of the next 10 years, making different decisions about what I was going to put in my body. And, you know, I, I firmly believe because I'm still, I still have the disease, but I've been, it's the disease has been stable for, 15 years or so, um, you know, and, and that's a blessing because a lot of people who have this disease have really deteriorated over that same period of time. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate because I exercise, because I eat a certain way um, that, I mean, at least that's my belief that that's why the, that's why the disease has not progressed. I don't abuse alcohol. Um, I, I rest, I get sleep. I try to do the things that I know are going to benefit my body long term. And those are the things I think, those are the reasons why I feel like I've, I've at, at this, to this point, been, been, been fairly stable with the disease. I mean, you're looking well. I can't see any, anything that signifies that you've got anything going on. I feel good. <laughs> I feel good. You, you know, um, a couple of days ago, I was, um, I was playing your track, Dear Diary, uh, to my wife. And she didn't know it was you. 
even though when I met her, we were listening to, to your records and everything, you know, so she knows who you are, obviously, you know what I'm saying? But we were listening to that and she goes, that sounds like Eminem. And she was trying to make out that you sounded like Eminem. And I'm like, no, you need to go back and understand that this guy was doing this way before Eminem, we even knew who Eminem was, you know? So how does that feel like? Because I feel like there's a lot of similarities and that similarity is very obvious in, in a track like Dear Diary. To be fair, the, the flow in Dear Diary was, it was inspired by what Eminem was doing at that time too. Because when I heard the beat, to me, the beat sounded like something that M would rhyme to. And so in my head, I kind of heard his voice and tried to figure out how I was going to rhyme over this beat. So as much as I may have influenced him, on that song, the influence was actually the other way, other way around. Yeah. I wanted to also just go back to the symphony and just basically ask you what, what it felt like to be knowing that you're on the mic. You've just been thrown into a situation where you're thinking that you're just going to be the first person to because we all know the story. Right. You're the first person that's going to jump up on the mic and then you think your voice is going to get taken off. And you were just kind of like that guy who was just kickstarting it. But then you ended up being on there. How, how was that? How did you receive that? I mean, it must have been like a boom, shock. I mean, I was definitely surprised. Because um, I don't know if Marley, I don't know if Marley told me ahead of time that he was keeping me on the song. I, I, I feel like he played it on the radio. And that was how I found out that I was kept on the song. Because um, at the time it was like, oh, you know, we're just going to have you come in and just do a little something so these guys can warm up. But I don't, I don't remember knowing ahead of time that he was keeping me on the song until the song got played. And I was like, Oh, they kept my part. Oh shoot. Wow. Okay. That's dope. Um, but even then, cause my phone was ringing off the hook. Like when the song got played on the radio, a bunch of people knew it was me. My phone was ringing like back to back to back to back to back. Yo, know, that's you, that's you. Uh, uh. Um, but even at that moment, I still didn't really register what the song, what the impact of the song was going to be or what the impact of the song was. You got to remember, we hadn't even shot a video for it yet. It was just a song. Um, yeah, it was my first time really hearing myself on the radio, minus the Howard Park. Remember I mentioned the song Howard Park that Marley played like once or twice. So I had heard myself on the radio before, but that was just like a demo. This was like a, I knew this was going to be a song that was going to come out. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, it was, a, it was a first. And then I'm on a song with Big Daddy Kane, who at the time was a pretty big deal um, that people were definitely paying a close attention to because his song just rhymed with biz and get into it. Those were bubbling. I think, I want to say Raw was out at that point. So he was like a big deal. His album was about to drop. So for all of those reasons, it was a, definitely a cool moment. But I still didn't have a concept of what it meant in the big scheme of things. I didn't know what, I didn't know what it meant in the grand scheme of things. Because like I said, no video had been shot. I didn't know if it was going to be a single. I didn't know any of those things. So it was hard for me to really, like it's easy to look back and go, wow, that was crazy. But at the time, you're not really understanding what, what is happening when it's happening. Well, like I said, it was a beautiful accident just waiting to happen. And what a blessing to the world, though. So, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Uh, thank you for doing what you did there because uh, you showed a lot of us the way. I got to thank Marley. I got to thank Marley for asking me. You know, you've been working with Marco Polo for a few years now. How did that happen and how long do you see this carrying on? What other projects have you got lined up? Me and Marco... Met back in 03, I think. Um, he gave me a beat CD. I like some of the beats. I asked him for some more. He ended up producing a song on my album, Aloha Summer, called Do It Man, featuring Rapper Noid. Um, in exchange for that, I gave him a song for his album called Nostalgia, which ended up being like his biggest record of his career to this, to this point. And because of that collaboration, fans have been wanting to hear more from us so we finally um slowed our schedules down enough for us to collaborate on the album 2018 a brooklyn story 
um, and it was a great success. Fans loved the record. We toured the world with it for two years until the pandemic hit. And during the pandemic, we started working on the next project. Um, that project is now finished. Um, it's coming out um, this year. We're excited about this new project. It features, uh, we got features from uh, Inspector Deck. Um, Strickland is on it. Worsworth is on it. Um, we got um, Shea Noir is on it. Speech from Arrested Development. Um, Blue from Blue and Exile is on it. Um, I'm trying to remember, can remember everybody, but it's a dope album. We love the album. I think fans are going to love it. We're, we're in the mixing. We're we're past the mixing phase. We're not just in the phase of listening to it to make sure everything is lined up right. Um, but that's coming. I'm excited about that, and look for. A tour coming soon. We're coming to the UK um, very soon, actually, to perform. Going to be in London with Big Daddy Kane, and then and then a few other dates um, around the UK before we head back to, to you know to re to release this album. So you've got a show that you're going to be doing on the 26th of August at the Forum in Kentish Town. Yes. Quick word on that. Looking forward to it, man. Um, me, me and Kane don't get to share the stage very that that often as we would like. Um, so. This is going to be a treat for sure. Um, he's actually performing this weekend here in Queens, New York, at the Rock the Bell. So I'm gonna jump. I'm supposed to jump out on stage with him during that show, but we'll see. It's not. It's not official yet. But yeah, man, just um, excited about touching down in London at such a big, such a big arena, and um, the, the 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 lineup looks great. I can't wait. So I don't know if you noticed or not, but uh, I wrote a musical. I didn't know. I wrote a musical called The Falling Season. Um, and the plan is um, as soon as we finish getting, as soon as we finish the funding stages of, of, of everything, is that I want to open in London. I want, I want to open in London um, next year sometime. Um, so the first place that it will be seen in its full production will be in London. So I need you to start spreading the word. To, to folks out there that Master Ace's musical, The Falling Season, will be coming to town sometime in the near future. I mean, bro, if there's any way we can help, like to push the word out, just send me clips. I will always share them. Like I said, I'm a big fan, even up to this day. So anything you want me to share, just send it. I'll share it. We're definitely looking for theater partners there in the UK. I don't know if you know people in the theater world, but we're definitely going to be looking for the right theater um, to, to partner with for this. Um, so any and every connection that you have out there would, would, would definitely be an asset to, to the process. Shout to my, my theater, my theater partners here, Rhymes Over Beats. Um, that's the name of the theater company that, that took this on. Uh, Patrick Blake is the, the director of Rhymes Over Beats. Shout to him for believing in this process. Um, and we had a, we had a stage reading back in June, uh, with an, Almost an almost full cast, and it was uh, amazing. We had two full houses, and people loved it. Again, thanks a lot for being here, bro, and uh, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you, man. I look forward to seeing you um, at the 26th. So anyway, guys, look, uh, it's not often I get to sit in this chair and talk to one of my heroes. And when I say hero, I'm talking real hero of mine. Like, this guy inspired me so much, along with Big Daddy Kane, you know, Kooji Rap, and Kyaris One, and Chuck D, and Rakim, and... So I'm, I'm humbled. I just feel like to be able to sit here and talk to someone that has inspired me the way Master Race has is amazing. And it's one of those reasons why hip hop means so much to someone like me and I'm sure to many others. But yeah, just basically, uh, if you want to find out more about what Master Race is up to, look out for his album that's coming. Make sure you go and support the album. If you want to go and follow him on his Instagram pages, not if you want to, just go and follow him on his Instagram page and everything. Because, you know, that's where you're going to find out most of the information. Just, um, you know, go there, follow him, support him, look out for the album, buy the album. Don't just stream it, buy the physical copies as well. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching. And we'll see you soon. Peace.